Well, hello, good evening. It's the 16th of, I'm going to say February, 16th of September, 23. And uh, I'm doing a little vlog from my home address. It's not, it's not often I do that, so it's been a long while, actually. Um, nothing's changed much. Snowman's still there. And the fire's not on this evening, but I did put it on last night just for a bit of... Uh, warmth because it's quite damp around about the neighbourhood with the rain, the incessant rain last night. And I have noted that the, uh, well, there's a winteriness for the top mountains, uh, the highest mountains in the UK over the next uh, few days, I think starting on the 18th of September, so there's nothing unusual about that. S snow in Ben Nevis is quite standard in September and the high Cairn Gorham tops. So no uh, climate change there. No global warming. In fact, uh, I still haven't acknowledged my complaint to the BBC in regards to the, uh, well, the very particular weather we had at the beginning of July where there was snow in the Quite a lot of the Scottish mountains, uh, certainly above uh, three and a half thousand feet. But uh, I'm not here to talk about weather. Uh, I've had one of those very. Um, let me just turn this distraction down. I had the radio on because I don't have a television. As you know, I've not had a television since January 2015. And I haven't missed a second of it at all. I've mentioned that often, but it's worth saying. But, uh, yeah, so I've done absolutely nothing today. I, uh, it's not not like me to do nothing. I mean, I don't, I don't mean I did absolutely nothing. But um, I've done some things, but uh, it's general for me to, to try and include some activity in my day. And... Uh, but I decided a day off is uh, much required for uh, certainly feeling the effects of all these uh, high mountain uh, ascents and descents and stuff like that. And uh, body needs a little bit of time to recover. Don't care what anyone says, it's not good to keep pushing. You've got to allow the body just to you know, relax on some occasions. But that said, I mean, uh, I haven't been really outdoors at all today. I just, I just decided that there's nothing, nothing I wanted to do, and I've uh, just taken it nice and a nice simple day of rest. But what I was thinking about there, and the reason I turned the camera on, and it's become a bit of a concern for me. I think I've covered this subject previously, but uh, it's been a while. I'm thinking about the uh, the middle classes actually. I'm thinking, well, the middle classes uh, in the UK. I think they're at some sort of crisis point, and I I mentioned some time before that we need to, you know, preserve or conserve the uh, aristocracy. But I also feel that we need to pay attention to the middle classes because. You know, without the middle classes, uh, we, we actually would lose a, a huge uh, chunk of our, uh, you know, our way of life if, uh, if, the, if the middle classes gave up their entirely. Um, there would be no, uh, I don't think there would be any need for garden centres, for example, really. I mean, uh, I'm not suggesting that the working class or the or even the proletariats don't go to the garden centre, but uh, they're less likely to, to, you know, to spend a, a lot of money. I mean, any, uh, I'm not talking a little vibrational here. I'm talking um, it's, it's purely economics. I mean, if uh, if you're uh, watching your budget, it's it's, it's not going to be easy to be visiting the. The garden centre, so, um, you don't get many um, proletariats uh, 
going to theatre or, or, you know, they don't tend to <clears throat> go to uh, buy tickets for a, you know, for, for a sort of quartet or something you're playing in a, a local place, but middle classes tend to do that, you see. And um, not all of them, of course, but uh, it's, uh, it's a high likelihood that the uh, middle classes will be uh, looking to, uh, you know, stick the noses in somewhere. And um, generally that is of a, a higher brow, uh, a, high, a higher calibre at least of uh, what the, uh, the proletariats of the working class would be doing. I mean, what I think actually is, um, I mean, a lot of this, a lot of people blame it back to, you know, they're talking 40 years now, they blame it the Thatcher era and stuff like that. It's nothing to do with Thatcher. Um, but Tony Blair's mob, I mean, when they announced that they were, you know, about social mobility, they, they meant what they said. And they, uh, I mean, just like Thatcher announced that, uh, you know, what she was going to do, she made sure she did it. Well, in, a, in some respects, so did Tony Blair and his mob. But uh, it was to her detriment, I'm sure. I feel that, at least. And certainly feel that it's to her detriment to have a, um, a current political setup that we do have in our own country here in Scotland, and I think it's going to be a detriment um, totally. Uh, to the middle classes, if uh, we're not careful. I mean, um, they're after, they're after you know, trying to take every pound they can from every individual in, this, uh, in the, the country. Well, of course, they can't take anything off the proletariat because they don't have any. They can't take anything else off them because they don't have enough. And they certainly can't take it off the working class because uh, the working class don't have enough. The barely, you know, barely surviving as it is, uh, um, you work all week, but you still have to, you know, end up in the, the queue at the food bank at the, perhaps once a month or something, you know, and um, you get uh, lots and lots of uh, visits by the postman, popping uh, ever larger amounts uh, detailed on, on bills, you know, for utility companies and whatnot. But what I'm trying to say is that the um, they're after the middle classes now, and um, the first thing they want to do is you know up the uh, the amounts that the middle classes perhaps pay on their property. I mean, it, it, let's try to find try and find a, a fair balance here. I mean, the middle classes have done very well uh, overall. Um, it probably in the, in the last fifty, sixty years. Uh, maybe even more that they've done you know, pretty well in, 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 in the UK and perhaps it's uh, their turn to give up some uh, some of the shares of the bounty that they've uh, accrued. Um, I'm talking maybe with the increase in property prices and uh, you know, having lavish holidays and uh, being able to afford the children to get to uh, public schools or, or even private education or... Uh, you know the, the, the you know they may also um, have um, memberships like go golf or tennis club or uh, you know, they maybe um, pay for tuition for or extracurriculum educational stuff you know maybe languages or even uh, musical instruments and stuff like that all all this comes into the equation but what I'm trying to say is that um, well. If the uh, government decide that the uh, middle classes can afford to pay more, and, and the uh, decided to, um, you know, push up the council tax or something like that to um, unbearable amounts, then uh, perhaps lots and lots of this would start to crumble. And what I mean by this is that uh, they may then not be able to afford to send their children to uh, public schools, and public schools will then suffer. And the private schools, you understand. Well, the, the public school is private, but it's, uh, it's just the terminology, you know, public schooling and boarding and stuff like that. But uh, all the day pupils and stuff like that at a, 
that many of the preparatory schools and uh, public schools, of course, across uh, uh, Scotland, you know. And, um, I mean, the whole way of life is, 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 is going to be interrupted just because the government have uh, overspent and they want to fill a black hole that they created themselves through their own stupidity. And I think that to come after the middle class is a very dangerous game because, um, I mean, the middle classes uh, uh, create a, a very good standard, in, in my opinion. I mean, it's, uh, I've mentioned before, the aristocracy don't give a damn. Uh, they don't need to. I mean, aristocracy wear shoes like I've got. I mean, I've, I've told you before, I think I've got aristocracy in my blood because, I mean, these shoes are uh, completely and utterly um, broken beyond repair. Uh, although I haven't tried to repair them, to be honest, but I, I, I might still do that with the glue in a, a late winter's evening or something. Yeah, so they're not very good, are they? But uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're not uh, in such a bad condition that they need to be thrown out. But, uh, and neither, I just found a spot up there in my sock with the hole, but what I did was uh, I, um, I bought darning needles and some wool. I, I might actually nip through and get that. I think I put it on a video the day I bought it, but didn't load it. But I, rather than buy new socks, I'll just sit there for five minutes and darn these ones with the, uh, the darning needle. In fact, bear with me a moment, please. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, I bought this, uh, can you see this rather large-eyed uh, darning needle? It's absolutely massive. I mean, it's, it's huge. But, uh, so I got this one, and this one here is a bit more... Well, this has uh, got a very sharp edge, but it's... Uh, it's for me to mend my rucksack. It's torn in a couple of places and it's got a big eye on it, you see. And then what I bought was uh, some very fine uh, darning uh, material. Very good, uh, high quality cotton this is. And, uh, you know, it really is one, it's the best product on the market, I'm sure. And I've got some, uh, you can't see it in this light, but this is actually a very dark navy blue, which uh, will go just perfectly with my sock. You see, there's no difference there, but they're both uh, dark navy blue. When I picked up this up an absolute bargain, I got that for 50 pence. And it's a, it's a very nice uh, merino wool. So I shall mend... Uh, any of my socks to save me buying uh, new socks. And this is what uh, middle classes don't do. They, uh, they just chuck everything out. Uh, even before it even starts to wear, they just uh, chuck it in the bin. They don't even give it to a you know, second hand shop or charity shop or even, uh, you know, I don't think they even bother taking it down to. Uh, uh, be recycled or anything, just chuck it in the bin. Because they've been so used to uh, replacing things, because they've always had, uh, well, they've always had credit cards and, uh, you know, extra di disposable income, because um, the house prices have always been ri rising at such a rate that they can afford to just chuck everything in the bin. So maybe from that perspective, it might be quite good for them to get the council tax hike higher than everyone else, so they start to, uh, you know, be a little bit more frugal in their actions. But what I'm trying to say, without mumbling about all this stuff, this is a perfect example of what the aristocracy would do. If, uh, I mean, there's absolutely no point in throwing anything away if it's still got use. Do you understand? So all I need to do with these shoes, I mean, look, this, this one's actually not very good, good condition at all. Um, I mean, the stool's still there. I've showed you this before. I'm quite, I'm quite positive I did. But um, I mean, it obviously needs some laces. I've discarded the laces at some point just to 
let me get my feet into them, but, <laughs> but um, yes, these are still repairable, in my opinion. And um, as I say, I'll, I'll sit one down one night and, and uh, do that in the winter. Never put a shoe on top of the table, and you know that, it's not good. But uh, anyway, back to what I was trying to talk about. If you get um, the middle classes with less uh, disposable income, I mean, for example, uh, you've got uh, wine shops, fine wines and stuff like that. At the, the middle classes will probably go in there and they'll buy their favourite tipple or something, and maybe buy the case load or something, I don't know. But uh, if they've not got money, then that's not going to happen, and therefore the wine shop's going to be standing there drumming their fingers on the counter going, I don't have any customer base, because the middle classes don't have any money to spend. And then they'll be struggling, and then they should close down, and everything, uh, it's not a shop closes, and it means that the supermarket then have a, a further hand in the market, because there's no competition. And uh, you have to take what uh, Tesco or even Marks and Spencer's decide is the wine of the month and shite stuff. Really, shite. Whereas if you go into specialist wine shops, you can always be assured it's quality wines and uh, there's a good chance that the proprietor or at least someone behind the counter knows what the hell they're talking about. Because if you said to... Uh, you know, an assistant in test, would you have any, any wines from the line dock at all? What? Do you have any wines from the line dock at all? I'm looking for a, a rosy or a white. No, just, just what's on the shelf. I mean, it doesn't have the same feel about it, does it, you see? You know, if you walked in, you said, I. You know, like if you're in a delicatessen, you said, uh, have any prosciutto ham, please? Uh, yeah, yes, please. And, um, you know, Italian ham, of course, but, um, you know, you, you had to rely on getting a bloody tin of corned beef or something. I mean, fucking hell. But, um, I think what I'm trying to say is like, okay, the, the working class people of the nation, most people are actually working class when you consider it, because most, of them, most people work. And uh, the ones who don't work, either through illness or laziness, is, um, I mean, they're, they're best considered to be, um, no, you can't class them as being working class because they're not down working but they're still under the working class umbrella and then you've got the, the, the slippery slope where lots of people through no fault of their own have, have, have slipped into a, a lower uh, spectrum and uh, this is what creates uh, proletarianism and uh, people who then just give up on uh, trying to do anything and rather than you know maybe make nice curtains or something for the window if the cats if you can't get you know buy new ones or even get the ones to fit from a charity shop or a, you know they might even consider making them or something or get something to make them for them but they don't bother they just stick a bloody old sheet or blanket across well that's the start of proletarianism isn't it it's the start of a slippy slope and this is something that wasn't really that evident in uh, in our country at all um, well, certainly over the last 50 or 60 years it's not been at least and um, I mean you you wouldn't you wouldn't imagine that if, uh, that say somebody who is middle class and currently driving a, a Volvo or something uh, would ever dream about sticking a 
an old sheet in front of the the windows or something to block out the daylight. No, it's unthinkable, isn't it? I mean, the first signs that I saw that there was something happening with the middle classes is, uh, well, they stopped uh, putting fresh flowers in the, in the vases in, in front of the window, even though sometimes behind Venetian blinds or something. There's less fresh flowers, but you know, dotted around the uh, hallway and in the, you know, the, the lounge or, or even the dining room or something, you know. And of course there was, uh, you know, when the flowers are, are, are not there, then that's, that's trouble for the florists, isn't it? And um, another thing I noticed with the uh, middle classes and uh, the sad decline was the um, there was no fruit in the fruit bowls. And I find this quite alarming because you would always, always, in fact it was even in the working class homes you would, I mean, there maybe wasn't a lot there but there were a couple of grapes and uh, maybe a an apple with a wasp or something sitting on top of it, but uh, at least it was an attempt, but uh, now there's nothing. But in the middle class homes, there was always neat um, arrangement of uh, fruit, you know, in a bowl. No one ever ate the green apples or the, or the shiny red apples or the, uh, the one pear. They were only bought for display for the... Uh, for the lounge area, or the, you know, for the uh, the hallway even or something. You know, it, was, it was all middle classes are very good at uh, this pretense that the everything's looking good, but uh, but you know, if you if you went into the kitchen for ha perhaps you'd find that there was only one banana or something to eat, but there was plenty of fruit on display for visitors. Um, but they weren't allowed to touch them, of course. Even grapes, you know, all green and black grapes. But uh, as I'm saying, this is something that's not happening. And then if you uh, find that there's uh, no fruit in the fruit bowl in middle class houses, then obviously that's going to impact on the, the green girls. So if you can find one, that is. In fact, it's... Uh, you can't find a post office is open, you can't find a bloody bank anywhere, and you can't find a green girl, so not a baker's, not a damn butcher. So, I mean, do you understand what's happening? It's, uh, it's all going to fuck. And the last people we have to save the, the whole thing from sinking is the middle classes. And I'm not talking about the Tony Blair's socially mobile middle class people who just happened to do quite well because property prices were rising steadily uh, for 20 years or more but uh, I'm talking about the uh, you know the, the proper middle classes who were well educated and perhaps had businesses or, you know well, well certainly they spoke with a fine articulation of the uh, or they maybe had, um, you know, some uh, some providence in their background in, in life, but uh, not uh, just somebody that happened to get rich quick or something, you know. But, um, yeah, so the, the, the definitions for me, at least for the, you know, I, I certainly can identify the middle class the upper middle class, of course, and, and definitely the aristocracy. And I love the aristocracy, I really do. And um, it's such a shame that they've got no money, the aristocracy, but uh, at least they, uh, they hang on to uh, the whole ideals and traditions of way of life. But it's, even that's been eroded, sadly, because of uh, things like capital gains tax. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not fair for them because... Uh, these people were the, the backbone structure of the whole of our country. For, you know, well, certainly when I was growing up, at least, I still remembered that, uh, you know, you give some 
element of respect to the, uh, the aristocracy when they shuffled by and the, the ruins and the tweeds and the stuff, you know. Because they almost thought they were very gentle people, gen genteel people, and, uh, you know, sometimes they were very rude, but, um, but they were also very genteel. And I, I, I absolutely adored the, 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 uh, the aristocracy. I adored the working class too, of course, but um, not so much the proletariat, unfortunately. And, you know, and um, I do find that uh, there's a whole uh, social switch has occurred, and uh, nobody knows what the hell's happening now. It's. Uh, it's all gone to pot because uh, social mobility is now going out to the window as well. It's all, um, well, it's all just a case of uh, everybody's to be exactly the same. The whole world over. With no character, or personality or identity. And uh, that's what scares me most. So for the, for the subject of this little vlog, of probably quite a long vlog now, I'm saying that we need to cherish and uh, look after and uh, ad maybe not admire, but at least, uh, you know, try and preserve the middle classes. I mean, we need people to buy tennis rackets and we need people to, you know, have the proper, you know, garments for, you know, around the golf or something. Not not the cheap shit that you buy out of these sporting shops, but I'm talking about proper Pringle, uh, you know, woolen sweaters that, and uh, the very decent trousers that the, the golfers tend to wear. I don't know the bloody name because I've never played golf enough to buy a pair of trousers to play the damn game. And I know that you, if you turned up to the golf, um, now, if I turned up with these bloody hill climbing uh, uh, trousers that I'm wearing just now, um, they would let me in the bloody door of the golf club. They'd say, no, I'm sorry, you mate, but you're not playing golf in these. You need to wear a ping hat and, uh, you know, you've got to have a certain style of dress. You've got to have a collar on your T-shirt, for example. I don't want a collar on my t-shirt. Well, I, I, if I want a t-shirt, I don't want a collar on it. Well, you do if you have to play golf. I'm sorry, but that's the rules. All right. And what about this pink hat nonsense? Well, you, you have to wear a pink hat to identify that you're a golfer and you're enthusiastic about golf. And I don't want to wear a pink. Well, you're not going to play golf then. Bye-bye. Uh, I mean, this is the problem with the um, some of the stuffiness regarding the middle classes, but, uh, you know, the former stuffiness that uh, used to exist, well, st it still does exist in, in many respects. I mean, it's very difficult to uh, join in conversation with uh, certain individuals if you, um, you know, <laughs> If you've been sitting in the in the bar, and you, you know, for example, and there's a bit of, uh, the bar stool at the bar, and, and a sort of upmarket type of establishment, and there's a couple of chaps yapping away, and anyhow, yeah, oh, that's, that's why, yeah, I think all of us are, yeah, that's good, and you know, just uh, excuse me. Could you pass says yes, thank you. And you do this and and uh yeah. And then you turn to this uh, so I couldn't help uh, hearing but you said you were in Kalumpa. And then one of one of these middle class chaps would probably say, Yes, yeah, this is Malaysia. I said, I knew I was there. And they got all sorts of upset when you when they looked at you and thought he doesn't look like he's he's one of us. He's what? <laughs> he's not one of us. What the hell is he doing in Kuala Lumpur? And uh, so I, this is a sort of pre-social mobility of uh, Tony Blair's time uh, in, in some respects. But uh, 
Yeah. I think they should have left the whole damn thing alone. It was wonderful just before um, it was all meddled with. I mean, I loved it. And uh, everybody had, you know, fine suits and going to, you know, tailors and boutiques and you know, hat shops and stuff like that. And proper cobblers and, you know, smart shoes with, you know, polished. Yes, and I don't know. Everything's all gone to shit. I don't remember any opticians when I was uh, growing up, though. That's one thing I... I've never seen an optician in my damn life. I, I, there was one shop. I, I, yes, there was, Andy. But, no, it wasn't like those... Um, people wore spectacles. They didn't wear these bloody big, stupid things on top of their nose, like... Like, um, I don't know what they look like, some sort of Bakelite structure that sits on the nose with uh, great big bloody panes of glass. And that's not spectacles, that's, that, that's making a spectacle of yourself. No, spectacles were you know, little rounded things like, um, and mostly worn by elderly people, you know. Yeah, that's what spectacles were. Maybe sometimes a little bit of a angle to them. Sometimes a bit shaped like the corns. But uh, not these great big bloody things sitting on the top of your nose. I think they're hideous. And somebody must have started this fashion back in the start of the walk era. And I uh, thought it looked good. And then everybody thought, well, that looks really smart to wear that. I think I'll get a pair of those fucking stupid little things. And they started wearing them. And somebody else at the office said, oh, where did you get the spectacles? They looked smashing. Oh, I bought them because they looked like the shit. They made me look stupid. No, I, I, I think they're very attractive on you. And uh, I like... I don't need spectacles, but I think I'll get them anyway. That's the sort of way it all fucking went. It's the sort of fashion statement that got in vogue and then it just took off and people who didn't even need spectacles started wearing the bloody things just to be high fashion, like wearing a tattoo on your shoulder because some bloody celebrity or pop star had one, but they didn't really, it was a fake. And then they felt fucking stupid years later when they realised that the bloody... Uh, Music, uh, so the pop star was uh, not not at all tattooed in the first place, but they've got it for life. That's a sort of imbeciles. It's uh, what's a sort of proletariat type thing, isn't it? Yes. Well, not always any. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So I thought I'd open up this sort of conversation because I might have a few more of these kind of digs and stuff about what's going on and try and wake people's bloody heads up to what's all happening. But I do, I do really think that they should uh, watch very carefully that they don't uh, upset the middle classes. Because um, the middle classes are the only ones that are keeping things ticking over. And if, um, if, the, work, if the middle classes decide to stay Holland is spending. They don't spend a damn penny. Well, I think everyone's fucked. Seriously. There'll be no tradesmen doing any jobs and there'll be no... Uh, you know, there won't be any uh, people in uh, specialist shops being able to serve the middle classes and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I really think... That we'll come back to the subject... Uh, to, a later date. This will be a long vlog, Andy, I'm quite sure.